Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 28th, 2013, and my guests are Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers. Betsy is a professor of economics and public policy at the University of Michigan, and she was the chief economist at the Department of Labor. Justin Wolfers is a fellow at the Brookings Institution and a professor of economics and public policy at the University of Michigan. Betsy and Justin, welcome to Econ Talk. It's great to be here. And it's good to finally talk, Russ. Now, you are my first pair of guests on Econ Talk. Uh, it's going to be exciting to see how that goes. You guys are going to have to uh, share the mic. We're going to talk about a number of issues today. We're going to start with research that you've done together on the relationship between happiness and income. Then we're going to talk about a column you wrote on the work of Reinhard and Rogoff. And if we have time, we'll close with some unrelated issues. So let's start with your contribution to what is sometimes called the happiness literature. And let's begin with that literature, uh, the origins of that literature, the work of Richard Easterlin. What did he find? So the Eastland paradox is um, three empirical claims and then an an implication that follows. So the first claim was when you look within a society like the US at a point in time, you find that rich people are happier than poor people. The second was that if you look instead across countries, he failed to find any evidence that rich countries were happier than poor countries. And third, when he looked at countries through time, Uh, he failed to find any evidence that as they got richer, they got happier. So that seems paradoxical, hence the title. And uh, his preferred explanation was that uh, what must be going on is what matters is relativities. If what matters is your income relative to the Joneses, then that would explain why rich people in a country are happier than poor people, but would also explain why uh, rich countries weren't happier than poor countries because when you're in a rich country, your neighbors are rich too. And that's that's uh, something that will offset the, the impact of your own richness. So Easterlin's uh, findings and his um, interpretation of the data have led him to a very, very clear policy recommendation. And he'll state, he's stated uh, that a focus on economic growth is simply not in the best interests of society. And that's because he believes that the correlation you see when you look within a country where wealthier people seem like they are happier or more satisfied with their lives than poorer people simply reflects status and that there is nothing that's actually gained as we develop because we, you know, maybe because we acclimate or we get used to things. But to give you just a really stark example of the of the Easterlin outlook or the Easterlin hypothesis Now, if you take a village in Africa that doesn't have running water and you bring running water and you give it equally to everybody in that village, from Easterlin's view is that you didn't make anyone in that village better off. If you bring it only to the chief's house, you have made the chief better off relative to everybody else in the village because you've changed his relative position by increasing the difference between what the chief has and what everyone else has. And... How did he measure – and this is, of course, always going to be an issue in this literature. It's one of the questions I have about it. How did he measure happiness? What was that measure based on? So the standardness – and this is what all economists do um, who are analyzing happiness – is you uh, analyze large cross-sectional surveys where you go out and you ask people either how happy they are or how satisfied they are with their lives. So I – I have to admit that I came to studying these types of questions with a great deal of skepticism. And what's been really stunning to me is the work psychologists have done to to really validate not only how useful these questions can be, but also how universal they are. That people, you know, if I uh, tell you, you know, how satisfied I am with my life, if you took a picture of me and you showed it to strangers, they would be able to get give a reasonable guess uh, that would be correlated with, with my life satisfaction. So, in fact, psychologists have done that kind of study where they've asked people to rate their 
satisfaction with their lives. They've taken pictures of them and they've shown those pictures to strangers and they've found that the what the strangers assign to people is correlated with the actual numbers. They've also done things like asked friends and family um, and found that friends and family tell us things that are similar to what the individuals say. So it turns out that simply asking people, you know, overall taking things all together, how happy would you say your life is or how satisfied are you with your life? People give answers that are consistent and interpretable. Yeah, well, later we're going to talk about replication, I hope. And I, I'm very suspicious of those psychology studies of showing people a picture of a person, a snapshot, I assume, not a video of their of their day. But um, that, that would be – it's possible. Uh, I'll, I'll remain open-minded but because I don't know that literature very well. But I, I, would, I would wonder about that. That would seem extremely difficult. And part of the problem I have is that when I think about my own happiness or my own satisfaction – yeah, there's a general overall number on a scale of 1 to 10 I might have from time to time. It might change over time. might change when you ask me. Um, but it's kind of a rich concept to reduce to a single digit, even with a decimal point, isn't it? Well, I think just about any interesting social indicator is. Um, think about the, the rich experience of our lives that is summarized by gross domestic product. Or the incredible richness of the labor market we try and summarize by the unemployment rate. I have problems um, with those too. <laughs> I'm with you on that. As long as we as long as we're willing to admit that all statistics are imperfect, I'm on board. Okay, that's fair. Uh, the other thought I have is is uh, Henry David Thoreau, who said uh, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. He's a bit of a pessimist. It might have been time centric when he said that. It wasn't maybe the best of times when when he was uh, writing, but. Uh, there is a certain illusion uh, that we get, present to the world, a certain mask, uh, a certain number we might list in our 1 to 10 scale that might mask what we really feel like deep down inside lots of times. But so having – if we, we all had understand that this is a somewhat mushy concept and yet, Betsy, you point out that it seems to hold up with some interest in larger applications. You know, it, it really does and I – I think, you know, we've also sh they've also shown things that it's correlated in the way that you would expect it to be with life events. So, uh, you know, people who recently divorced are in the process of divorcing are uh, less happy or less satisfied with their lives on average than people who are newly married. Uh, people who've experienced a death uh, are less uh, show declines in their happiness and life satisfaction and have average uh you know, as a group have average life satisfaction that's lower than people who haven't recently experienced that. So it it is surprisingly consistent and useful. So now let's go after Easterlin. Um, talk about what work you have done, the two of you together uh, in this area, and where does it fit in with other findings that, that have uh, – that people have found in, in trying to understand a relationship? Yeah, so this is where we, we prefer to relabel the Eastland paradox, Eastland's hypothesis. And the reason is we think the data just don't agree with him. Um, the usual way social science debates go is we all agree on the facts and then we argue like hell about what they mean. In fact, our approach has been the opposite. We've just been trying to figure out what the facts are. So let's go back to the three key facts. The first is we agree with Eastland that within a society at a point in time, rich people are happier than poor people. The second claim that Eastland made was he failed to find any evidence that rich countries are, on average, happier than poor countries. He said that in a very particular way. Um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and what he was doing was looking at very small samples. And so when he failed to find an effect, a statistically significant effect, he assumed it was zero. Today we have much more data. We've looked at data from 160 countries around the world. And it turns out that levels of GDP per capita are incredibly robustly related to average incomes across countries. In fact, it's one of the tightest cross-country relationships I've ever seen. The correlation between GDP per capita and measured life satisfaction is 0.8. So it's crystal clear today rich countries are happier than poor countries. But the, the Easterland, the problem with Easterland's earlier work sort of goes a bit beyond that, which is... Um, that he made a claim about a hypothesis he didn't test. So the hypothesis he tested was when you look across countries, 
do you see that the average happiness of a population is correlated with the average GDP per capita? Um, and he was unable to find uh, that there was any positive relationship there. Right? He wasn't able. He he was unable to reject zero. This is what Justin's saying. He failed to find evidence of a positive relationship. But the claim he made was that the relationship you see within countries, that the fact that rich people within a country like the United States are happier than poor people, was a stronger relationship than what you see across countries. So this is really delving into the nerd talk, but if that's the claim you want... That's what we're here for. (laughs) Delve away. If that's the claim you want to make, you don't test the hypothesis. When you look within countries, do we see a statistically significant effect. And then when we look across countries, is there a statistically significant effect that's different from zero? But instead, the hypothesis you want to test is, is the relationship we see within countries statistically significantly steeper than the relationship we see across countries? That's the hypothesis he was claiming with words, but it wasn't the hypothesis he was ever testing. So one of the first things we did was just went and tested his hypothesis with his data And it turns out we couldn't uh, find any evidence that the the within-country relationship was indeed steeper. And the reason was there was so so much imprecision in the cross-country data that while he couldn't reject zero, he also couldn't reject that it was just as steep as what you saw within countries. And so our conclusion is finding that small samples don't deliver clear results is not a paradox of any type whatsoever. So let me just pause for a sec. We, we've talked about some of the imprecision of just trying to measure happiness with a single number in a survey, right? These yep. are these are all individuals that are asked, I assume. And then when we go yep. to the cross country, we've averaged a bunch of individuals in, say, America, and we're comparing them to a bunch of individuals averaged in Costa Rica. And the United States has higher per capita income than Costa Rica. So the question is whether the U.S. has higher happiness on average than Costa Rica, correct? Yep. So in the United States, those surveys are done by, say, the Gallup organization, some of them. There are others done, I assume, by other people. Uh, When you say we have 160-something countries, whatever the number was, I wonder how reliable the data are in some of these countries. Just because we had a podcast with Morton Jervin – Oh, a while back where he pointed out that just for example, the GDP numbers, the per capita income numbers aren't very reliable. So how do I know that these these relationships are are statistically meaningful given that the data are probably a little bit sloppy? That is a great question, and I'm so glad you started by telling us how bad the GDP numbers are and how they're not very reliable because I don't think you want – we want to argue these are the most reliable, you know, that these numbers are completely reliable. But I think what we want to do is compare them to other cross country data that we have. And in fact, they may be better than the GDP numbers. You know, the one of the things we're showing is that this happiness is highly correlated with GDP. That may be important, not uh, it, that may be important because it may say that the happiness data may actually give us a better snapshot of GDP at a point in time than the actual GDP measurements um, because it is a much simpler question. It's something that's been tested and is uh, robust. And so if it's something that's actually highly correlated with GDP, it may provide its own use in, in, in dealing with an international context where it's incredibly difficult to measure all sorts of things. Russ, let me add two things. The first is the best well-being data today come from Gallup. Gallup are actually in every one of these 160 countries. So the Gallup World Poll is a methodology that is as far as they can do something that's exactly the same in each of these countries. They're very careful with translations and so on. And I should add parenthetically, I work sometimes as a consultant to Gallup just for the interest of full disclosure. The second, though, is to think about the implications of what you said which is the Eastland paradox proposes that the correlation between GDP and and happiness is zero. We find that it's extremely high and it's 0.8. And you're you're suggesting, well, actually, both GDP and happiness are terribly measured. And the worse the measurement is, of course, the more that biases 
the, the estimated correlations be towards zero. So it's amazing that the correlation is as high as 0.8, given that I'm finding that's a correlation between two noisy measures. So following your logic, in fact, we're understating how close the relationship is between GDP and measured happiness. Well, that would be true if, if the errors in the two variables were random, right? Right, it, absolutely. It, it could be that it's not just that, oh, sometimes people make mistakes in coding that could be higher and lower. It's that there's systematic bias in how the data are collected, transcribed, which is which I think is true sometimes in the GDP data. But I take your point. Um, it, it is – I think one of the things that's fascinating about thinking about this, is, which I had not thought of until we had the conversation, is that I really had been focusing mostly on the sloppiness of the happiness measures. And I, then I realized later, wait, whoa, 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 <laughs> wait a minute. They, they both have some problems. Um, but let's. Oh, I, I, I'm really glad you point that out because when people think about our studies between the relationship between happiness and income, they focus a lot on how sloppy these happiness numbers are. Whereas I think we worry even more about how sloppy the income numbers are. But you see, the income numbers have have more decimal points, of course, more digits. I mean, so they must be more accurate. Don't we know that? Um, well, moving along. Um, so, what kind of reaction? There are other people working in this area. Do they confirm these findings of yours? Do they contest them? What What's the state of liter literature right now? So, my reading is that most economists have our view that there is no Eastland paradox, and there probably never was. Um, and the leading psychologists in the field, people like um, Danny Kahneman, have also got that. Have also adopted that view as well. Um, that's not to say that we've convinced everyone. There was a first generation of happiness scholars who thought that this was going to be the path to enlightenment, for whom we've, uh, among whom we've made less impact. And it's a difficult situation. There are people who've sort of made it their careers to sell the idea of happiness as being a better metric. And, of course, that was all the more compelling when that different metric also gave them exciting new and different policy implications. Our policy implications turn out to be, well, when you look at happiness, you get pretty much the same thing as when you look at GDP. What, what economists have been doing all along isn't so bad. It's kind of a boring implication for some of them. Betsy, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I, you know, one of the things um, – that happened is you take Easterland's view and, um, you know, I gave, I started by giving the example of bringing running water to a village doesn't make people better off. That idea is, has always been a little bit hard for a lot of economists to stomach, particularly development economists. So some folks came up with this idea that, well, a maybe, threshold. yeah, maybe, maybe Easterland is right after a threshold. Um, and that, that idea, as far as I can tell, came out of desperation to hang on to the Easterlin hypothesis without having to believe in the absurdity of not being able to make people who are at very low levels of survival um, better off by giving them more access to food and clean water and things like that. Um, but in fact, no data set has ever shown that there's such a threshold where um, further increases in income no longer make you happier. Justin and I finally documented this in a paper um, that just came out in the AER papers and proceedings, just going through and showing that there's no such thing as a threshold. It is the case that the more money you get, the lower the incremental gain in happiness will be, the richer you are. In other words, the relationship is with the log of income, not the level of income. So doubling your income provides similar increases in well-being, regardless of where you are on the income spectrum. But obviously, doubling the income of a millionaire takes a lot more dollars than doubling the income of somebody you know, operating on $1,000 a year income. Well, so I want to – you said it. There's, there's no you – know, the technical way to describe this would be there's no satiation. People get increasingly – well, it's actually not the exact same thing. No satiation means you'd prefer more. Of course, you might not be happier once you got it, I guess would be a possibility. But you're saying that when people do get more, they do get happier. When I looked at one of your charts – I forget which one it was. But in one of your charts, happiness only had three different measures. I think they were very happy – fairly happy and not very happy, something along those lines. And as you looked at a point in time in the United States, what struck me was – so there's three categories. 
and I'm just going to pretend I'm going to give them numbers. One, two, three. Three is very happy. Two is somewhat happy, and one is not very happy. What struck me is, is as you get as you look across uh, people with higher and higher income, there are more and more people in that group in the very happy group. Uh, what also struck me is that there once you get past twenty thousand, there's almost there are very few people in the not very happy group. So that most Americans, and this was 2007, which was a particularly happy time. <laughs> so it may not be very representative, but uh, today, but I think it was 2007. What it suggested is that most Americans are either pretty happy or very happy. But that metric's not going to really allow me to make the claim you just made that you get happier and happier because we're all going to eventually run up against that very happy three. And we're not going to be able to tease out subtle differences in how much happier we are if we have twice as much material comfort in 30 or 40 years as we do now. So, Russ, this is one of those questions that I think is very important in theory and turns out not to matter in practice. Um, it's one we worried a lot about until we confronted the data. A lot of the other questions instead say how happy are you on a scale of 0 to 10 or how satisfied are you with your life on a scale of 0 to 10. And... Um, what we see is, you know, Americans are up around seven or eight out of 10. And, um, you know, people rightly say, well, at some point we're all going to be at Nirvana. We've done some calculations and we're not going to go off the charts. We're not going to have to turn it up to 11 in the yeah. famous yeah. words of Spinal Tap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For a couple more millennia. Um, so the issue is worth worrying about, but it's not for my children and it's not for their children either. Well, I can't I can't leave this topic without mentioning Adam Smith. Uh, we did a great deal of um, – uh, I did a, a six-part series with my, uh, my friend Dan Klein on the theory of moral sentiments. And in the theory of moral sentiments, Adam Smith says many times, uh, numerous times, maybe three in, in detail, that uh, the pursuit of money and the hopes of being happy is a delusion. Uh, do you think he was wrong then – wrong or maybe right right that right then but now things are different uh, or do you think the numbers that you're looking at are telling us something else about the human condition so i think what what this literature is complete is, is missing or, or needs to start focusing on is what is it exactly that's driving the relationship that we see between you know well-being and income because i don't actually think it's the income per se. I think it's the opportunities that the income provides. Now, this is my view. There's a tiny bit of evidence on it. When we look at, at data across countries from Gallup, where they provide some pretty rich uh, other questions, you see things like when you know people have more income, they're more likely to say that they get treated with respect during their day, um, that they have choice over how they want to spend their day, that they have good tasting food to eat, all of this describes a life where as you have more income, you make choices to put yourself in a better situation, in a situation where the people around you are more respectful, in a situation where you are have more control over your day, in a situation where you like what you're eating more. So that way we can construct our lives when we have um, more opportunities, more capabilities, I think is, is a big important part of this and it's correlated with having more income but that doesn't mean anyone should look at our studies and think that if you're offered two different jobs the higher paying job is going to lead to greater well-being according to the what Betsy and Justin find I don't think that our studies can lead you to make that conclusion at all it could be that you know the lower paying job is you know comes with all sorts of non-pecuniary benefits that are going to be terrific for you but what we find on average is that people with more income have more capabilities for making the kinds of choices in their lives that allow them to have more income and have more of other things. And those people on average are better off. Yeah, I'm pretty confident that the three of us, that none of us have chosen the highest paying job. Um, I, I remember being an assistant professor. I think I'm older than both of you. I'm um, 58. Uh, I was an assistant professor in 1980, and my first job paid – I think it was a little under $19,000. Um, I was quite happy. Uh, I, I'm happier now, uh, and I certainly would have been miserable if I'd taken a uh, – been the chief economist at a 
worked on the economic staff of, a, say, an automobile company or worked as a government economist making maybe – maybe about the same. But but the the Wall Street and corporate opportunities were certainly higher for me and I wasn't interested in them at all. And I was very happy making $18,600 or whatever it was. I feel like I'm happier now, but it, it really isn't because I have more money. It's because my job's a lot more interesting than when I was an assistant professor and I like what I'm doing more. My guess is that much of that correlation to the extent it's true between happiness and income is is that third thing that, that you're talking about, whether it might not be opportunities. It might be the meaningfulness of your job. It might be the freedom to do certain things you couldn't do otherwise. So I, I do think you're right. I think it's something else, but maybe not. You know, that's I have a huge uh, emotional reaction. It's funny. I, I'm sort of torn between more is preferred to less versus we know money doesn't buy you happiness. So, I'm, you know, I'm kind of so I'm a little schizophrenic. On well, this you know, one. I have two uh, two sort of personal uh, things on that. So the, the first was when I graduated from college, I had offers uh, an offer at an investment bank and I had an offer at the Federal Reserve Board and the investment bank was going to pay, I think, about double what the Federal Reserve Board paid. And I took the job at the Federal Reserve Board because I knew I wanted to be to go to graduate school. And I thought the Board of Governors was going to set me up better for graduate school. And I also knew that it wasn't going to require the kinds of hours that an investment bank was going to require. And my, I remember my mom saying, how can you turn down that kind of money? And I said, you know, Mom, I can always get a job waiting tables in the evening if I want to make more money. And I'd yeah. probably <laughs> be happier having the diversity of activities in my day. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it... It, you're you're right to say that we don't all choose the thing that's going to pay us the most. And, and instead of instead of waiting tables to make more money, I actually did 20 hours a week of volunteer work um, with that spare time. But it it is the case that I think it's it was the ability to make that choice, um, to be able to choose that because I wanted to, um, that I think contributed to some of that well-being. Let me address, there's a distinction here. Two things can be true at the same time. It can be true that income or whatever it's a marker for matters for happiness more than um, the Eastland hypothesis suggests. It can also be true that income matters less than most people think it does. So Kahneman and Deaton talk about what they call the focusing illusion. If I ask you how much happier you'll be with another $1,000, you think only about that $1,000 and, and all the great things you can do with it, and you think it will be terrific. And then when you give people $1,000, it's not actually so amazing. So, you know... By no means is this saying that money is the be all and end all. Do you want to talk about any of the policy implications? Uh, you said it, it. It seems to suggest that that growth is a good thing. I'd state that in the negative. Um, there are people who use the false Easterlin hypothesis to claim that growth is a bad thing. Um, there's no evidence in support of that claim. Now, there's enough double or triple negatives in that sentence. You'll probably end up where you ended up. But uh, I just want to be a little bit more careful. Well, I think There's a correlation versus causation issue here. That's what I'm trying to signal there. There is something else that comes out of our work that's important, which is that um, greater inequality does re reduce aggregate well-being. Um, and that's because of the fact that this relationship is between well-being and the log of income. And therefore, as you know, it, if you take a dollar from a rich person and you give it to a poor person, the gain in inc the gain in well being to the poor person is larger than the loss in well being to the rich person. But there is a loss, and I, I think what's important is to know, uh, you know, that any that redistribution does take from one person uh, to give to another. But it's clear that you can increase aggregate well being in your society by doing some of that redistribution. Yeah, I'm. Um, I, I think inequality is very difficult uh, and tricky because obviously it depends what the source of it is and the story that you just told. Uh, absolutely, right, and so. it depends on what happens when you take. Right? If uh, if you can take without there being a leaky bucket, then uh, everything I said goes through. Depending on how leaky you think the bucket is as you do that transfer. Uh, could change everything. Yeah, I think it's striking how little we know reliably about the leakiness of that bucket that we're talking in a really – in a metaphor that you and I understand, but it just – to make it a little clearer, I think would be – there's two issues. There, There's the disincentive effects 
the magnitude of how much or how less people will work when you give them money and take money away from them. And then there's the administrative costs. I think the administrative costs are pretty small, uh, but I don't think we know as much about the incentive effects as we think we do. I find them very um, ideologically driven. I think people who tend to be in my camp of smaller government tend to think incentive effects of taxation are large, whereas people on the other side are more interventionists, think they're close to zero. And um, I don't. I think those are just close to religious beliefs. I don't think we have a very good reliable estimate of that. Um, I will, you know, this, this is definitely not something that we've looked at, but I, I take that point. We can so, stay away from religion and politics if you like, Russ. <laughs> good. Excellent. Uh, well, we're going to, it's not going to be easy because I want to switch gears. I want to turn to Reinhardt and Rogoff, which I think is fraught with um, ideology and religion, but. Uh, so, I think it shouldn't be. Yeah, I agree with you. So let's talk about that. First, for people who've forgotten about it already or who never heard about it, you know, if you're in the blogosphere or the the pundit sphere, it's um, it's a raging inferno. But for I think a lot of Americans, they've never heard of Reinhardt and Rogoff, even some who listen to this podcast, uh, although we, we did talk with um, Carmen Reinhardt about the book. So uh, this time is different. But the controversy is over some work they've done trying to measure – the relationship in between debt and growth. So talk about what they found originally and what's uh, been the source of the firestorm, at least for those who are in the kitchen. So they, they put together several data sets looking at the growth of public debt through time. Um, the most prominent of which was a data set over the past, in the post-war period for 20 advanced economies. But separately, and this is separate from the whole firestorm, is they put together data on um, – the same countries over the past 200 years and also a set of developing um, economies as well uh, over the past 50 years. What they found was um, – what they did was they looked at the level of GDP growth for each, for each country on average when it's public debt, government debt, was high, medium or low. What they found was GDP growth tends to be lower when the higher is uh, government debt. That's just a fact. And that's what they threw out there. Um, the policy claims are more contested and more complicated. So one claim would be, well, high public debt therefore causes low GDP growth and therefore we need to stay away from high levels of public debt. But that's a causal statement and it's one that I think that the initial analysis doesn't support. Um, they're simply looking at correlations. Now, the other... You know, where the firestorm broke was that a, a very smart graduate student at UMass Amherst found, wrote to Reinhardt and Rogoff, and they sent them, sent the graduate student their data, and he found literally an Excel error that instead of averaging growth over 15 countries, over 20 countries, they, they averaged it over 15 countries. They literally just highlighted the wrong numbers on the spreadsheet. There were two or three other issues that came up subsequently beyond that Excel error. And they range from the Excel error is a clear error to at the other end, there are when you're running empirical analyses, judgment calls that one must make and reasonable people can disagree over them. And it turns out, roughly speaking, that the more egregious the error, like the Excel error, the less it actually matters for the bottom line. And the more we delve into these judgment calls, and both sides, I think, make reasonable judgments, the more it becomes, uh, the more material the different judgments become in terms of changing the result. At the end of the day, the folks from UMass Amherst want to claim that they found terrible errors and that Reinhardt Rogoff's negative correlation between public debt and growth is wrong. That's an overstatement. Even once you accept all of the corrections and uh, amendments of the Amherst folks, it's still the case that countries during periods of high debt tend to be growing slower than during periods of low public debt. Now, there's a second issue, which is they talked, Reinhardt and Rogoff talked a little bit about what happens when public debt is high, and they defined high as being above 90% of GDP. And somehow that became a threshold that politicians and the press really liked. We've got to keep public debt below 90% of GDP. The claim that there's some magic number like 90% beyond which public debt, beyond which economic growth starts to really fall off precipitously does turn out to have been an incredibly fragile and I think almost certainly false claim. So it's true that higher debt is correlated with low growth, 
We also don't have any evidence that that's causal. And the initial claim by some that there's a magic number beyond which debt shouldn't go looks like it needs to be revised. So let me jump in at a, a couple of clarifying points. So first of all, I, I think one of the things that has gotten lost in this debate is the unbelievably uh, tremendous contribution that Reinhardt and Rogoff has made has been to gather this data that no one had gathered. So I, when we wrote our, our column on this, I can't tell you the number of people who said things like, oh, you know, uh, an Excel error would get you, you know, a failing grade as an undergraduate, as if they had get just- Get you down- fired as a contractor. Yeah. yeah. You know, just as if they had just downloaded some data off the internet and then had accidentally added it up incorrectly. You know, one afternoon's work gone wrong. Um, you know, the, their contribution was, get, it really has been putting together an amazing data set. And I, I, it's been disappointing to see that completely overlooked and then making it available for people to have this debate about what it means. Um, the other thing is that, you know, Justin says, I, I get, I, I want to jump in when someone, when he says, look, uh, there's a correlation, but we don't know how to interpret it. Sometimes that sounds really dismissive, like, of course you should interpret it. It's a core as something that's causal. You know, it's an important correlation. But in this case, there's sort of no real reason to think. I, there's lots of reasons to think why it wouldn't be causal or why there would be some third factor that's causal. And I find or it why, Or why causation could run the other direction. I mean, I, causation they, could run the other direction. And that exactly. wasn't a secret. Everybody – I think they – I haven't looked at their work lately, but everybody I think understood – that this could have been caused by, gee, when you're not growing very fast, you run up a lot of debt. Exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the important things is that what they were looking at was growth and debt in the same year. So this isn't like a pattern of, you know, as you have debt, what does your future growth trajectory look like? This is just, here's the raw data, here's the pattern we see. And the, you know, that there were, that there was, a, you know, as Justin said, but that there was a mistake that means that the that how slow the growth is during periods of high debt is not as slow as they thought. It's substantively the same. The point remains, and uh, you know I I don't think that there's something different to take away from that. I think there's a deep issue here about how we communicate economics. We write very careful papers. Um, that we publish in obscure journals in the hope that almost no one will ever read them. If they're interesting enough, then someone will pick them up and maybe write an 800-word op-ed about them. If that's interesting enough, then maybe someone like Carmen will be invited to give congressional testimony. If that's interesting enough, that, you know, five minutes of testimony, then that 15 seconds of that will be excerpted on the news that evening. And if that's interesting enough, another politician in Europe will stand up and say something for about two sentences um, without acknowledging, you know, Reinhardt and Rogoff as the source. And through all of that uh, process, we end up losing a lot of the nuance along the way. Um, so there are people who certainly made claims that were unwarranted that it was the debt causing growth. And there was also, I think it's also fair to say that serious PhD economists generally stayed away from making that sort of rookie error. I will say that, um, you know, one lesson that all economists and PhD students should take is that it's very rare that your data gives you the precision to make a threshold claim. And, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we just inve- investigated thresholds in the income and happiness data. You know, it, it really takes a quite precise data. Um, and, it, you know, the idea that they were going to have this 90% threshold seemed kind of silly on its face. And now that the data has been corrected, that threshold didn't stand up. Um, but I think that the people who consumed the research took that threshold more seriously than the authors intended. Yeah, the part I find remarkable about it, and I, I think, I think the point that Justin, you gave a little timeline, a little a narrative of how your work could get increasingly interesting to people. I think the problem is, is that we as economists like the idea that people are reading our work, so we do tend. I think, I think it's very difficult to avoid what one of you called, or I think. Betsy called a rookie mistake. Uh, it's easy to make rookie mistakes because it's fun to be on the front page of the New York Times or inside the op-ed page, and it's fun when politician pays attention to you. Uh, maybe it shouldn't be, but I think a lot of people have trouble with 
avoiding the feeling of increase, increase, increases happiness. You get you up there on the scale because people are paying attention to you, and it's uh, sometimes that's a big that's a big change of pace. The part that I find hard about this is that they made an error, as you said, the error didn't. It changed the quality, the, the quantitative nature of their finding, not the qualitative nature. We had lots of qualitative and quantitative evidence that it wasn't decisive anyway, which is I found – was the thing I find so strange about this, right? Japan, I think their debt-to-GDP ratio is over 230 um, percent. They're not doing great, but they're not doing horribly. They can still borrow. They, they don't face the interest rates that other nations face to have – much lower rates. So there's an obvious enormous amount of imprecision. And yet people are going around calling Reinhard and Rogoff murderers because they engendered austerity, which kills people. Now, you know, my claim is we haven't seen that much austerity. It's true. Maybe they gave some cover to politicians to talk about austerity. But other than Greece, there aren't a lot of countries that are cutting spending dramatically uh, in the face of this crisis. I think I have two reactions to that. One is we should assume that in the absence of any other evidence that people are acting in good faith, people on both sides of the aisle. On the flip side, you know, what we do matters. It's the reason I became an economist. Recessions do kill people. That's a fact of life. They harm people. Um, so we have a tremendous opportunity as economists to help shape the debate, and with that does come huge responsibilities. Um, I... I'm not sure any side of this debate has covered themselves in glory. In fact, I think probably quite the opposite. Um, it's been a, a bad episode for economics. We've only looked worse in the public eye. Um, but I do think it's important we take what we do extremely seriously. So, you, you know, the, the thing that I find kind of the most silly about these claims that um, that they are responsible for austerity and that they wouldn't have been if they hadn't had the the mistake that they had in their paper is that those two things don't go together because you, you know, as we said, you correct the mistake and you still find the claim. And therefore, if the claim was going to be, was being used, it would have still been used. So I don't think that the, uh, I, I don't think that it was made, that much stronger. People use the research that they want to use to make the points they already had. I mean, you earlier mentioned this idea, you know, politics and religion, that people have these religious views. What they do is they go out and find research that backs them yep. up. Yep. And that, you know, that there were people who had religious views that used mm -hmm. Reinhardt and Rogoff to back up those religious views. And I think if their paper hadn't had, you know, if the Excel error hadn't been there, if they had done aggregation in a different way, I think that their paper would have been used in the exact same way. That's an interesting point. I mean, I think the, uh, in a way, I don't really care about the the whole the whole hullabaloo or brouhaha, kerfluffle, whatever you want to call it, tragedy. I don't know. You know, depending on your perspective. Um, so I have not carefully read their policy work on this beyond their academic work, beyond the book. Um, I know they have written a sentence that said 90 percent is – I've seen this recently – isn't a, quote, real threshold such that at 90.1, uh, you start to struggle and at 89.9, everything's hunky-dory, everything's fine. Uh, but you know, some people probably did and I guess – and maybe they did. And again, I don't really care. I'm not here to judge them or, or decide. We're not a court of – the three of us are not a, a court of law here to figure – a court of – of anything to figure out what, how culpable they are in this. But I think the general lesson is anybody who said that was a fool uh, <laughs> based on the nature of the imprecision of empirical work. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be wary about large levels of debt that may some c come along and, and bite you in unexpected ways as a nation. You find yourself unable to uh, proceed, which is – you know what we just went through. This start of this financial crisis is a lot of it came from overly leveraged firms that thought everything's fine, and then all of a sudden, suddenly, unpredictably, it wasn't fine. So that lesson, that's a good lesson to me. That's something you should be wary of. It doesn't mean you should never borrow as an individual, as a firm, as a nation. But to say that, well, we now know ninety percent is where it gets the waters get get 
Rocky is seems really silly. Well, what's silly is the idea that there's one there's one thing called debt. If we borrow a bunch of money to send everybody in the country up to a fancy beach vacation, we should expect something different than if we borrow a bunch of money to uh, lay internet throughout the country, improve the highways, uh, and uh, fix our failing the failing infrastructure in our school system. You know, we should expect different outcomes from different types of spending, and different types of spending are more justifiable when it comes to accumulating debt. I, I agree with that. Justin, you want to weigh in on that? I always agree with Betsy Russ. <laughs> you want to add any nuance? <laughs> Now you want me to look her in the eye and tell her she was insufficiently nuanced. <laughs> I want you to. I want you to, to enhance her argument, perhaps. I don't know. I I think there's a subtle and important issue here about how we communicate economics. We can talk all day about the technical issues and how to run the regression right and what different forms of debt we should measure and what control variables should be there. But at the end of the day, many of the issues you were just talking about are fundamentally issues of economic communication or sometimes miscommunication of how our ideas do move from dusty journals into the policy debate. And, you know, if that's your perspective, and it's certainly mine, that actually makes folks doing like what you're doing, economic education through the podcast, actually really important and critical players. And it's something that, you know, in our universities, we don't pay a lot of attention to how to carefully communicate these ideas, but actually the few times we have influence, it's only because we've been careful about how we communicate. Yeah, well, I certainly agree with the last part. Um, let's turn to this issue we, we, we referred to earlier, which is replication. Um, a lot of people are using this, as I think Betsy said, uh, a lot of people are it, when they see an axe, uh, they're going to grind it. You know, they just need to grind their own axe. So one of the axes that's getting ground in the aftermath of this modest scandal is um, economics is garbage. Um, which I have to, sus I have to admit, I have a certain sympathy for the idea that empirical work is often unreliable. But I think it's gone way too far in response to this Reinhardt and Rogarf thing, to where people are now saying, "Up, oh, see." It's all trash. It's all – there's full of mistakes. Uh, what do you think the lessons we ought to learn for just just the error part, not this debt growth uh, issue, but just the fact that a prominent paper was found to have an error? All right, so I'm going to begin with the defense of economists. Um, people will say we're bad. People will say we make mistakes. People will say empirics are unreliable. I think I can admit all of those things and still admit we're better than the alternative. So, you know, the alternative is bloviating ideologues. Um, and the fools we see on TV, and even mistake-ridden papers, I think, do a better job than that. That's the defense. Now, I don't want to be defensive. I, I think there's a lot we can do. Our attempts to – there have been several large-scale experiments, people attempting to replicate economics papers, and the results have been unbelievably disappointing, uh, ranging from people being unwilling to share data, which is not true of Ryan Hunt and Robert, to uh, results simply not replicating to, in fact, in an experience I had, I tried to replicate someone's results, found the opposite of what they found, and that person was in front of Congress giving testimony based on their original findings, their wrong findings, a couple of weeks later. Um, so replication is critical to having people trust and believe our results, and we don't have a strong enough replication culture. I think, I mean, the problem really lies with the journals that don't want to publish replications. And what I'd like to see is actually a complete overhaul of how we do it. Um, you know, part of the problem is that you'll get a really, uh, you know, a nice long paper published in the AER, and it'll turn out that there's some error that maybe is important but doesn't throw the whole paper out. So the journal editor thinks, I don't want to publish 10 pages on what, you know, the mistake that was in this. Maybe we need to have, you know, uh, uh, maybe we need to have short, you know, some sort of new short version of two page replications that get published, whether it replicates or not. And every, uh, every paper in the journal gets a shot at, at having a replication study published, even when it can replicate. So you can, you know, say, no, this paper was replicated by someone who submitted their two-page replication. It, it's a problem because we don't have an outlet. And there's lots of people who have stories of replicating papers, 
finding a mistake and then having a hard time figuring out where they're going to place that uh, that paper because the original journal has decided that they don't want to take it. Um, and that that's just, you know, you, if you're a young scholar, you do not want to do replications. It's not going to build your reputation. It's going to annoy people and you're going to have a hard time fi- figuring out where to get it published. And the result of that is bad results stay, wrong results stay published and people keep thinking wrong results are right. Yeah, the, um, by the way, for listeners out there, the AER is the American Economic Review, perhaps the most prestigious mainstream journal in the field. Uh, now, perhaps we can learn something from psychology. I interviewed Brian Nozick, a psychologist, uh, a while back, and psychology is going through a real crisis of of confidence in itself. That's a horrible, st- stupid thing to way to phrase it, but psychologists, I'll say, are starting to wonder whether a lot of the results in their field that they've trusted for a long time may not be true. And they have two issues. They have they have a serious issue of rep- replicability. They also have fraud. In, in recent in the last year, there's been some serious fraudulent, clearly fraudulent, not just errors of omission, but fraudulent uh, findings. And uh, they're doing something about it. And it's it's relative, excuse me, they, people, certain people are trying to encourage replication, change the culture in the journals, create online places, which, you know, it's absurd that the AER would say, you know, we don't want to give up 10 pages, you know, in, in today's world, that, that that's bizarre. They should have a, a website devoted to replication, perhaps if they could find candidates for doing it. If people were interested, as you say that, I think that's the bigger problem. Yeah, I think what's going on in psychology is fascinating, and it maybe hints at deeper problems in economics. I mean, the, forget the fraud stuff, because we all know fraud is bad. That's simple. Um, the, the real problem that psych, psychologists have had is many of them run pilot surveys or pilot experiments, and when they don't work out, they just throw them away, and when right. they uh, <laughs> do work out, they publish them. Yep. You run 20 studies, one in 20 is going to be significant at a 5% level. And they just have no idea how much stuff got thrown out. Well, think about that problem applied to economics. We don't actually have to get undergraduates in the lab to run a pilot study. All I have to do is download the data and run the regression. It's very cheap for me to do that. And then if it doesn't work out, throw it away, never report it. So their replication problem is essentially an under-reporting problem. And our underreporting problems may be even worse because it's even cheaper and easier for us to be looking for different ways of sifting through the variables to try and find something that's significant. Um, and so this is a different rationale for needing replication, um, that it could be that the first author's just got lucky and something that works in US data, well, a good way of checking it would be to see does it work in British data as well. And so I think there's two things here. One, we need... Um, when I write papers now, I try and write papers based not on one data set, but on five or six or 10, and in some cases, 20 different data sets to see if something's true 20 different ways. And the other is a different view of what replication is. It's not just taking someone else's data. It's actually going out, taking someone else's idea and testing it in a different way. Correct. And we need more of that as well in economics. Yeah. So I, I want to add two things. One is that, is that we talk about replication and too many people miss it. It's a very hard word to understand um, because most of the time what I think I mean when I say replication is the broader sense of replication. If you, you know, if you take the same question, you try to answer it in a different way with different data, um, are you getting roughly the same results or is is everything very sensitive to the way, the initial conditions the author chose, the data set they chose, the specifications they used? Um but I, I also wanted to come back to another one of Justin's points, which is he said, let's throw fraud out. Everyone knows that's bad. But actually, I think that it's not a coincidence that fraud is coming out when they're starting to think about um, validating each other's work. If you have a culture where no one's checking anyone, then you don't have there's, – there's no incentive to not engage in fraud because you're very unlikely to get caught. And – you know, fraud. Just your conscience. Just your conscience. Which I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to minimize that. But you said no incentive. It's a little strong. But I take your. <laughs> I take your point. I take even economists have a conscience. Uh, but actually, you can make a narrower claim, Rush. You can only say even some economists have a conscience. <laughs> but when you, you know, it, it's, I, you know, I think it's useful to have some incentives besides people's conscience. 
to know that, you know, we check each other's work. So it doesn't matter if it's purposeful mistake or if it's an accidental mistake, that if something isn't done right, if something is wrong, it's going to be found out. And I think that that's the right way to run a field and to have research move forward. Um, and I think that psychology is learning that, yes, it's shaking things up, but they'll be better off for it. So there is the Stiglerian response to this, which is we don't need regulation that people will um, uh, self-regulate here. And this is something Betsy and I do, which is every time we finish a research paper, we fu- we, we publish both the data and the code on our homepages. Um Hopefully that makes us as authors somewhat more credible. Um, but more to the point, it creates, it provides the raw material for would-be replicators to go out and have a look through the data and see what they really say. And maybe that's even a, a useful discipline on us when we're doing the research. Yeah, it seems some of this is going to be solved to the extent it's solvable through emergent norms that I hope propagate through our profession. Uh, it seems... One of the issues that's come up in the Reinhardt Rogoff thing, I hate to come back to it, but it's it's relevant, is how much did they share their data? Did they you know, eventually they did provide a spreadsheet, but evidently initially they just would provide some people have said, I've again I haven't followed the balls and strikes of this, so I don't I don't want to be unfair to either side, but some people have claimed they only would share their data source which is not the same as the actual data because there's decisions that get made and numbers get thrown out and you have to decide what line in the chart to use when you go to the government data set. So some people have claimed that they they made it hard for people to replicate their work and some people have defended them saying, well, yeah, because they spend an enormous amount of work pulling this together and just to give it away seems difficult. But it seems to me they ought to. I don't know whether they did or didn't. Again, I'm not commenting on that. It seems to me you ought to give away your work, uh, meaning you ought to provide – the data in the form that you used it. You ought to show the decisions you made. And I think the most – the biggest thing you need to do – and we, I, I talked about this in the in the podcast with Nozick in the psychology literature. If you really want to provide a video, a running tally of what you did, not just a little – something like we tried different specifications that did not change our results. Let's Give me a list of how many regressions you ran, the 700, with every combination you tried because – I want to be in the kitchen just to see how the dish got made. And if if you do that and you do it, of course, you can't always promise people do it honestly. But if you do it honestly, then there's some then there's some real credibility. And to do it honestly means that you would reveal how many times you went picking those cherries. I mean, it's really awkward how many times people run those regressions, seems to me. So we're starting to see that in economics, but we see it in a slightly different way, which is people pre-specifying what they're going to do, particularly with the large-scale experiments. So um, the Oregon Medicaid experiment, um, run by uh, right. Amy Stein and we John just Turner. we just did two we just did two podcasts recently on 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 those issues. Very interesting. You know, before they got a single data source back, they said, "Here's the regressions we're going to run. Here's the tables we're going to present," and that seems to be the clearest way forward here. I think it's easier with experiments, um, with those of us who are looking at observational data that have been around for decades, um, building the trust that I only ran the regressions I told you I was going to run. I'm not sure anyone would believe. I, I'm not quite sure how to do that. So I just, you know, I, I don't know what, I don't know anything about Reinhardt and Rogoff's willingness to share the data. But I will say that I, I think it is a harder call when, if you, when you spend years building a data set, and this is part of the contribution you're making, um, to give it away and have someone, you know, write the paper you were going to write next because you handed them all your work is a bit frustrating. I've certainly seen that happen in the profession. I think we're still sort of wrestling with how do we both have transparency, but also let scholars who part of their contribution is building data get the chance to um, you know, reap the rewards of getting to do the work that they want to do with that data without someone scooping them on it. Well, just to come full circle on our our equating of economics, ideology, and religion and politics, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were kept close by the people who found them for a long time. And of course, they had a, listeners will know, the bootlegger and Baptist argument, which is that sometimes you do things for self-interested reasons that you cloak in high-minded reasons. So, I'm sure they justified it by saying these are fragile, precious artifacts that we can't let 
many people look at them or they'll be destroyed. But as a result, a very small group of people were able to do the research. And so although I sympathize with your point, Betsy, it seems to me that most of what we're doing here in economics isn't the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, you know, I understand your point. There is a temptation to keep the data closed because you want to get the next paper out of it. But I'd like to see our culture, which the rest of the world's moving to in every other area of our life, that information is is relatively accessible. It seems like a good thing. I, I agree, but I do want to say that I do I worry about us not having the incentives in our profession for um, people doing original data work because not only it you know you're asking people not only to share it right away, but also I think we don't have sufficient appreciation. It's one of the reasons I led off by by when we started the conversation on Reinhardt Rogoff by saying, don't forget their contribution was an amazing contribution of data collection because it is important to recognize when people do that work. Otherwise, we're not going to have people do it. Yeah, that's a good point. We need a lot more of that in economics, and we, we're pretty lazy because there's plenty of stuff we can do already. Exactly. I, I agree with that. We ought to, we ought to, there's a trade up there. That's, that's the bottom line. Uh, well, we're out of time. Let's close just, um, I'd, I'd like to hear from each of you briefly, because uh, maybe you could go on for at least an hour on your own, but briefly, how the recent macroeconomic events of the last uh, five years have changed your view of, of economics or or the uh, our profession, um, if at all? Hmm. What a good question. Um, you can let Betsy go first if you, if you need to think about it. All right, Betsy. <laughs> I was really glad you were going first. Yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys, toss a coin. Toss a coin. I would like to think that we've learned – an appropriate humility. I'm not convinced that's true. Um, the other thing is I made a prediction two or three years ago that's turned out to be very false. Um, at the height of the crisis, I saw all economists becoming, no matter what field they were, theorists, labor economists, everyone, become much more interested in the macro economy and the ongoing policy debates of the day. And we had seen, I think, over the previous decade, macroeconomics go off and become its own tribe that stopped talking to the rest of economics. And so I thought welcoming macro back into the field would be healthy for all of us. And I'm not sure that's actually happened, um, although I remain hopeful it may. So I will actually, you know, come back, summarize by saying my views on the whole Reinhardt Rogoff debate were that the most important important thing when you deal with empirical results is that you keep an open mind and you revise your views as new evidence comes to light. And I think these last five years of looking at the economy have really, you know, as Justin talks about, introduced the need for humility among economists, you know, thinking about what we do know and what we really don't know, but also the importance of being open-minded, revising our views, looking for evidence and being willing to say, this thing I thought was going to work isn't working, or this thing that I didn't think would work is working. Um, and I, you know, I wish that we, we could all be more open-minded to thinking about, you know, what, you know, what's the, what we could do to improve the economy for the U.S. Because I, you know, I just look with horror at the number of people who are outside our labor market right now, either, or I should say outside the labor market or un inside the labor market, but unemployed. And there's just so many people that aren't able to make a positive contribution, uh, despite them having the capabilities of doing that. And I just think it's, it's a terrible thing for society. It's a terrible thing for the individuals. And, we should be considering all the different things, all the different possibilities for how we could make um, sure that everyone was able to make as robust a contribution as they would like to. My guests today have been Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers. Betsy and Justin, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.